Uh, so today is uh, Chappy Sunday, as Pastor Adrian had talked about, and um, the official colour to wear today is red, which I forgot, but I see some of you have, uh, have done that, whether purposeful or <laughs> accidental. Um, and so we just want to honour and remember chaplains. We have uh, SU, of course, is the one who organises Chaplaincy Sunday, um, and they work in the schools, um, both primary and high school. We also have chaplains in hospitals, prisons. Um, we have chaplains that work on the streets with youth um, and in nursing homes and other spaces. So, um, we, and work with the police force and other uh, emergency care services. So we are so thankful that chaplains get to go into spaces that, <clears throat> excuse me, that you and I may never walk into. And they also are often the people on the front line when there's crises and emergencies. And so we want to remember to pray for our chaplains. Um, they need our prayers, they need our financial support, uh, and they need encouragement. So um, one of the initiatives that our church is doing um, with great thanks to Mark and Tammy is um, they've provided honey at, at the back and um, some of the profit of that will go toward chaplaincy. So if you buy honey, um, if you're a honey lover, uh, please come put your money in and take a, a tub. Um, the price is on the little sign there, $15 a tub for a kilo, which is a steal um, for excellent honey. We love the honey, so um, please continue to support that, and that will support chaplains as well. So let's just stop and pray especially for our chaplains today. Father, we just thank you that you are a God who is creative. We thank you that you are a God who goes before, that you are a God who opens spaces where your love can come in. We think of those chaplains today who serve faithfully in the community. We ask, Father, that you would strengthen them, that you would meet their, meet their needs, both emotionally, financially, spiritually, uh, and we ask, Lord, that you would protect them and their families, that you would give them extra strength for the task ahead, for those, those dry and difficult times, God. Would they lean into you and find encouragement in the church? Lord, we lift them up and we ask, God, that you would open doors for them to bring the message of the gospel through their loving action. Although they can't openly share their faith unless ask God, they share their faith in you by their love and the joy, by the hope and the security that they have in their lives. Lord, I thank you for their work. We ask, Father, that you would bless them. We ask for Jason uh, at West School. Father, we ask for your special provision for him today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we continue the series we've been working through in Acts, looking at Acts 11. So Acts 11, 1 to 18 is where we're going to pick up the story today. Um, and this is where Peter basically retells um, the vision that God gave him that we just read in the previous chapter. Uh, so Peter is having to explain to the circumcised Jews about why he is doing this work and why he is baptising and announcing that these people are part of God's kingdom. And we're going to have a look at the time, we're going to draw a comparison between the time that they were in and the confrontation that happened for Peter and this idea of listening together in times of change. Um, and if we think about it, the church is in a time of change, of huge change. Uh, the Church of the Nazarene has just uh, recently, um, there's been a team of people in America who brought a conference together to talk about how the church can faithfully care and love and build bridges into the LGQTI plus community. Uh, a group that the church has often overlooked, perhaps judged and shunned, but God loves everyone. And God wants us to be true to him 
and to find pathways to create connection and to extend grace to those who need support. So the church is in times of change and we have to be real about what's happening in our world. We have to be real about what what is our response? What is a faithful response to the leading of the Holy Spirit, to the heart of God in these unusual and difficult questions that arise, ethical and moral issues, um, the rise of the fundamental right and the rise of the liberal side of the church? And so we've got all these questions and dilemmas and how do we respond faithfully to God? How do we know what the Spirit wants us to do. So we're just going to read through that passage together, starting in verse 1, Acts 11. The apostles and the believers through Judea heard that Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went to the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheep being let down from heaven by its four corners and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds, and then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had sent, been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation in going to them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us that he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them and as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit, or with the Holy Spirit. For if God gave them the same gift, he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So here is Peter caught up in this dilemma where God reveals something to him that goes against what he understands as a a Jewish person. This idea of purity being honouring of God's laws, of being careful to keep them, of wanting to be holy and pure and right in living and right in heart. You see, what the circumcised believers were concerned about was remaining inside the fellowship with God. They wanted to live in such a way that nothing they did would put them outside of fellowship with God. That was, that was the heart of the matter. You see, it mattered to them socially and culturally and religiously who you eat with and what you eat. It's not just that you go to a Gentile's house, but part of table fellowship is that you eat what they serve, and that's often been served to idols first. And so that was the problem that the circumcised believers had. 
with Peter associating with this household. The other thing is you don't want to make yourself unclean. Otherwise, you put yourself outside God's faithful people. So it's not even just about what we do. It's about our our identity. So for them to eat things or to do things that would make them impure would set them outside the faithful community. So there is being outside of fellowship with God and being outside of fellowship with those who are faithful. So it's all about identity. It's all about who we are and whose we are. Because of who you are, God's chosen people, you want to live a certain way, act a certain way, do certain things right to honour him. And the other is this idea of solidarity, of unity with the community. That when you have this um, belief of God, Yahweh as your God, you want to together as a community worship him. And your participation in worship is part of that. So this idea of remaining inside the fellowship of God is what the objection is that these circumcised believers have. They hear about these people hearing the gospel, being baptised and being filled with the Holy Spirit and yet they're saying it doesn't sit with what we know. From the Old Testament, from our law, they are wrestling with this. Obviously other, other parts of the church accepted it but for them it was difficult. And if we look at Joshua 23, six to eight, we see these verses that help us understand why it was difficult. He says, be very strong, be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the name of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them, but you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. This holding fast to God, this constant fellowship is what they as God's people were wanting to do. And yet we know the story of the Jewish nation that God called them hard-hearted, stubborn, stiff-necked people. These were people that God called to be his own and yet they struggled to follow him. They struggled to trust him. They struggled to obey him. And I think we can relate to that at times in our life. But this was a defining characteristic of them as a nation of people that they really struggled with this. But then we have this, so we have this law that talks about not associating, not bowing down, not serving or invoking the name of the gods of people from other nations. But then we have this dichotomy, we we have this conflict. We see Jesus come as God and he does something different. We see this interaction with the centurion uh, and the story there is that the centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. And we know the story of this centurion where Jesus says that there's no greater faith in all of Israel as this man, this Roman centurion, this Gentile, has greater faith than the Jewish nation. What a statement that Jesus makes. And the basis of that, we see that this man loves the nation of Israel and he has built synagogues for them to worship their God. And he is a believer in Yahweh. He is a worshipper of God and he is doing good. And then we see this uprising attitude again, which Peter has uh, experiences in this confrontation in Acts 
11 happens to Jesus where in Matthew 9, 11, it says, When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciple, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Isn't that the heart of the gospel? This question, why does a pure and perfect and holy God sit with the most broken, those that we would cast out, those that we would say are impure and unworthy, Jesus comes for them. He eats with them. The greatest gesture of acceptance in the near Middle Eastern world is to be invited in to a meal, to sit and to share, to fellowship with people had great social significance. You see, if you went into someone's house, you were saying, I, by associating with that person, I have aligned my life with them in some way that says something about who I am. So Jesus, God, who is pure and holy, who tells his people to live separate from these nations who worship idols, comes to people and sits with them and eats with them and fellowships with those that wouldn't pass the Jewish law as being pure people. In Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, further on in Matthew, a similar situation where it says, the son of man came eating and drinking and they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners but wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Wisdom is proved right by her deeds. You see, there's something there that speaks to the story today. This spirit of wisdom, this spirit of the Holy Spirit, this wisdom of God comes in. And sometimes what we know in our head, what the rules are, what the parameters are, change because wisdom The knowledge of God, the goodness of God, tells us something else is right in that moment. And that is how he wants us to be led by his spirit to listen, to be people who have ears for God, for his leading, for his challenge, for his shaping, that he might be doing something new and different amongst us. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. You see, if what we're doing is right, then the outcome produces good things, produces righteousness, is extending salvation, is extending forgiveness, is bringing forth community and connection and repentance. Then we know the Spirit is in it. This is God at work. And he calls us and invites us in to this work, this work that sometimes goes against our logic. It goes against our comfort. It goes against our cultural and social ideals. And God calls us into this hard work, these places that we see chaplains work in, places with people sometimes we may not feel very comfortable with. The church goes in by invitation by high school principals that say, please come to my school, we need a chappy. We need someone to walk alongside these kids coming from brokenness, from neglect, from pain, from trauma. Can you come to our school and walk alongside these kids? Christ in the midst, in their presence. And that is what he calls us to be. You see, Jesus' actions demonstrate the hospitality of God. That God is this hospitable God who calls all into his kingdom who would respond to his invitation, his plan of salvation. You see, God is a living God at work in his people through his Holy Spirit. He is living. He is not a God of the past And I want to just reinforce today, the Old Testament is as relevant today as it was generations ago. Because the Old Testament tells and reveals the story of Christ, the character of God. It isn't irrelevant, it isn't surpassed by the New Testament. Together, the Old and the New tell the story 
of the one who reveals what God is like. You see, God is showing us new things. He is teaching us his ways. He is challenging our thinking and our attitudes. He is renewing our hearts and showing us how to live. He is the living God, the present God. So how do we know what God is saying in times of change? How do we know? Well, we hear this at the end of this passage in uh, Acts eleven eighteen, where it says what the response of these circumcised believers was as they heard the story of Peter, telling of the vision, telling of his interaction, telling what God was doing, how God was initiating and bringing him together with these people who already knew about God but didn't yet know about Jesus, who hadn't yet received the Holy Spirit. He was the bridge, the link for them to know the whole story. And their response in 18 says, when they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, so then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. There's some telling things in that sentence when they heard this. The first thing they did was to hear. They actually stopped to hear. It says, then they had no further objections and they praised God. They had this epiphany, this heart change, this transforming moment when they realized that God had done this. It wasn't just Peter's opinion or Peter's fanciful idea of ministry, but the Spirit of God was at work, that God was bringing change, that God was saving these people, that God was bringing people to repentance, that God was extending his kingdom into further parts of the world and drawing people in. But when we look back in Scripture, we see this isn't new. It was there right from the beginning when God called them to be a light to the nations, that they would be a blessing. The blessing didn't just extend to the Jewish people, to the nation of Israel, but was always for all people. But somewhere in their history, in their society, in their religious practice, they had lost sight that God was for all. But in Acts 2, we read this reference where Peter recognizes the coming of the Spirit is the fulfillment of Joel 28, 29, where it says, And afterwards, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. So you see that these servants, these God-fearing people from other nations were waiting to hear about Jesus, were waiting to be filled with his spirit. So what can we learn from the example of these circumcised believers that had issue with what was happening? At first they had to stop and think and reflect. And you know what? It's not bad to do that. When something comes against the grain of what we know and what we've been taught, we have to stop and be responsible and to reflect and to think and to pray and not be led off into wrong doctrine and thinking and say, is this of God? And that is what they did. But how do you respond to something you're not sure about? Well, from a practical sense and in a relational setting, I would say that James 1, 19 to 20 has something for us in the way we relate to one another when something new comes up and something we don't quite yet understand. 
we're not quite sure about. James writes, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. You see, if we want to live within the community, if we want to stay close to God and we want to be people who live right with him, then how we respond to people who might bring up different ideas to us matters. Because by our response, we can set ourselves outside the fellowship of one another, outside the fellowship with God in that moment where we become the opposition to the work of God because we don't sit and allow ourselves to really hear and understand what is God doing here amongst us. And we see it happen so quickly on social media where someone will post something and straight away people will respond, sometimes quite meanly. And sometimes you'll look at the post and think, I don't think they actually read the post. (laughs) They saw a word, they had a thought, this is what it's about and they fly off and they make comments and they attack people. And this is what happened. As I listened to the Love to be Loved, Loved to Love conference, these speakers talked about how as they tried to talk about loving and connecting with minority groups, that they have endured much persecution and criticism and judgment because people weren't prepared to stop and to listen. Be quick to listen. Quick to listen. You know, listening is harder than we think, isn't it? To really listen. And I struggle with this. I have young people in my family and they are so quick and astute. They have amazing insight. And I'm, I'll set off with my thoughts and then I have to think, hang on, I'm not even listening. I'm just off on my tirade about my thoughts and opinions and um, my family knows me well. I can get on my soapbox quickly about my thoughts and, and then I, I hear the Holy Spirit saying, hang on a minute, you're not listening. And as I listen, I start to hear things that challenge me. I start to hear things that are what scripture talks about, the dividing of soul and spirit, the word of God that helps us in those tricky things where we, there's those gray things and we're like, well, what is God saying? And I hear things as I listen that help shape me and open my heart to maybe something new I need to understand, something I need to be changed by. This idea of listening deeply Deep listening was this term developed by Pauline Oliveris. And this idea that we can listen or we can listen deeply. And to listen deeply means that we have to set ourselves aside to truly hear the speaker, to understand what their heart is saying, not be in my mind jumping to, oh, when they create a space, I'm quickly going to jump in with what I want to add or say or argue, but to actually stop myself, to suspend a space, to create a space where what they're saying is heard, a space to listen. It is what God does for us. And he invites us into a space where we can stop and listen to him. In Isaiah 53, 3a, it says, Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen and you will find life. As we listen to God, as we stop our busyness and our activity and our schedule long enough to hold space for God, we can hear his still, small voice at work in our hearts. The second thing is to be slow to speak. You know, that's really connected to hearing, isn't it? If I'm hearing and listening deeply, my words come slowly. They come at the right time when I've heard. And then I can respond accurately, helpfully, encouragingly, wisely, slow to speak. So 
So to do that, we have to wait for wisdom. You know, wisdom comes from God. Proverbs 2, 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So what we're seeking to know of how to respond is what God is saying. Not my own agenda, not my own cultural or religious ideas, but what is God actually saying in this? I can only find that from him. That wisdom and understanding I seek is found in him. And if it is from him, there will be that reflected in community. There will be people saying, oh, I feel God is saying this as well. And as we search the scriptures, it won't contradict what the Spirit is saying because he never contradicts himself. Beware of the pulling out of the, the verses to back up what we say. Let's go to the whole of Scripture and say, what does God say consistently? Is this consistent with his heart, with his nature, with his action? Slow to become angry. To be slow to become angry, we have to be not quick to respond because emotions can rise up really quickly, can't they, in interactions. We need to allow peace to lead our emotions. This idea of being slow to become angry is a play, comes from a place of stillness. To be still within is the space where we can hear people, where we can hear God, where we can maintain unity as we listen and say, I don't quite understand yet, but I'm going to keep listening. I don't quite know what God is saying. I don't want to jump in and speak for him. I'm going to wait on this. I'm going to pray on this. I'm going to let it sit with me and discuss it and pray about it with others who walk faithfully with God. So Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. See, peace can rule in our hearts as we as a community long for unity together. As we see ourselves as a body, not as individuals who all have the right to their own opinion, but we all wait as a community on God to lead and to guide us. This listening together in times of change requires holiness of heart and mind. This is something that John Wesley talked about, this holiness of heart and mind, this holiness of heart and life. It can't be just what we think. It has to be what our heart is about, our attitudes, our beliefs, the way we treat people. You see, it's no good saying, well, I'm doing all the right things and I'm behaving right, but you're not being right. And yet we're treating someone wrongly in our ability to prove our rightness justifying our own unkind behaviour because we're standing on the truth. God wants our heart and our mind to be authentically his. There's this quote by Frank Carver that in his book, The Quest for the Holy, he writes, where does the quest for the holy lead us? but all the way to the radical grace of the cross, to the reality of forgiveness. You see, their quest, the circumcised believers' quest, was for holiness, to be right, to have a community that was consistently right with God, that wasn't going to be carried off on some wrong thinking or wrong behaviours. But what they were missing if they didn't listen to the Spirit was this radical grace, this living God at work extending grace reflected in the cross, the reality of forgiveness, a God who comes even for the most unlikely, even for the most unacceptable in our eyes. If we're really looking to be holy people, we have to be looking to the cross. That Jesus died for me. That I am in the same place as you at the foot of the cross as a person in need of grace and mercy. 
Psalm 133 to 4 says, If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But you, with you there is forgiveness, so that we can with reverence serve you. You see, if God kept holding our sin against us, we couldn't fellowship with him. But it is only by his grace that we have the right to come boldly to his throne of grace, only because of what he did. So that with reverence, we can serve you. That is the attitude of the heart. When we're confronted with something we don't quite understand is to come before God, acknowledge that we are people who also stand in a place of forgiveness. And just to finish, Morton Kelsey wrote, or Kelsey Morton wrote, sorry, of divine love and grace as being a difficult tradition to convey to human beings. It goes beyond all they normally consider to be human and to be right. It is wholly other. You see, God's standards are so much higher than ours. His love is so much deeper than ours. His grace is so much wider than we would extend. It goes beyond all that we would normally consider to be human and right. See, we can set high standards, but God's standards are beyond. His love is more vast than we can imagine. We want to listen to the Spirit and be the people that reveal a God like that. Not a small God, a God constricted, but a God full of grace, a God of generous love. You see, there's this discomfort. There's a discomfort of the holy. There's this place where what's easy and comfortable and nice for us gets messed up because the Spirit's saying, This is the way. Walk in it. Here's a new way forward for the church. But it's uncomfortable. We don't want to go there. It's not easy. It doesn't fit with what we're doing. I don't know if we can. But God is in the space of the discomfort. His spirit calls us on into new things, into uncomfortable things. So how do we respond to something we're not sure about when God reveals it in a community. I would put to you that we should be slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to become angry as we listen together for the holy other, as we listen for the voice of God. Not the voice that suits us best, but what is God really saying to us? as his people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a living God, that you call us forward into what you have for us, into uncomfortable spaces, into unknown places. God, would you go before us as a church? Would you open the way? Would you open doors for your gospel, for us to extend your forgiveness and reveal it to others that you are a God who holds repentance and forgiveness out for others that they might come to you and find you as the Lord of their life. God, I pray your blessing on each person here. May you go with them and by your spirit lead them this day and fill them with your joy and hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.